Good morning, everyone. I'm Stan Emmert from USWTE, which is United States Waste to Energy. We are very fortunate to have with us uh, David Silliman, who, um, and we're going to get to David in just a minute, but I got to tell you that he is the foremost expert in the United States, and because we're the only ones that have this in the world on Opportunity Zone funds. And, uh, you know, David, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's just go ahead and start, um, David. As we as we get into this, how about just kind of giving us a, a basic backdrop of Opportunity Zones, of the Opportunity Zone funding, and what it is right now and where it is. Sure. Uh, basically, the Opportunity Zones itself is a federal tax incentive. It was added into the Tax Cut and Jobs Act in 2017. All 50 states, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands have what are designated zones, basically uh, districts, zones that are uh, lower income, economically distressed from uh, the rest of the zones that are not classified. Um, the way that the program works is that it's open to both real estate and business. It was intended for businesses as a job creation tool. Uh, it centers around an opportunity fund. Um, and capital gain investors, where investors who have capital gains can invest or roll their money into a qualified opportunity zone fund. They have 180 days to do so. And if they do, then they get some special tax incentives and some special step up and basis benefits for doing so. Number one is, and this is based off of, as an investor, an anniversary hold period in the fund, meaning I put my money in, left it alone. So the first benefit that I get is right out of the gate, I get to defer whatever tax on my capital gains today, this year. So mm -hmm. you know, basic example of how this works is if I sold stock in Facebook and I had a $100,000 gain, instead of paying the tax on the gain today for Uncle Sam for this tax year 2019, I roll it into an opportunity fund. Now I don't pay the tax today anymore. What I'm doing is I'm deferring the paying the tax until tax year 2026. In that interim, I've got a seven year period. So I get a five year step up in basis by 10%. Then at my seven year anniversary, I get a, a uh, I'm sorry, I get a 5% step up in basis at my seven year anniversary. So all together, when the tax is due, I get what's called a 15% step up in basis. So what does that mean in English? It means that instead of paying tax on $100,000, I pay tax on $85,000. And then the real benefit happens at the 10 year anniversary mark. And that's where you get a step up in basis to fair market value. Now, in that example with Facebook and the hundred thousand, let's say that at the ten-year mark, it's worth five hundred thousand. So now I go to exit the fund. That four hundred thousand dollar increase, I pay no uh -huh. tax on, and I got a fifteen percent tax saving. So on a five hundred thousand dollar total, I only pay tax on eighty-five thousand dollars. That is that's quite a benefit. And here as we sit on December the 19th, 2019, though, there is a sense of urgency that is that is coming up upon us here just basically less than two weeks away. There's an extreme sense of urgency because December 31st is the last cutoff date for this year, midnight, that I can get my money rolled into an opportunity fund, stop my time clock as an investor, and still get my full maximum 15% uh, step up in basis. Back to that 15% and that $100,000 example with Facebook, right? The difference between December 31st at midnight and 12.01 on January 1st is a 5% discount on that. So I'm losing out. So I'm gonna be paying tax on 90,000 versus 85,000. What this looks like in a real use case example is for somebody who may have had a $2 million gain that one minute in time from 1201 to, I'm sorry, from 12 o'clock to 1201 on a $200,000 gain, I'm sorry, $2 million gain, for example, that's like a $90,000 minute. It's wow. A $90,000 60 second choice. And that's, that's where investors right now are really trying to say, okay, you know, are there opportunity funds? Is, you know, this program is real? The answer is yes and yes. And then which ones are actually open that I feel confident, comfortable with that, you know, because it's not just about putting my money into the fund to, to take advantage of a tax benefit. I mean, that's the a big piece of it, but it, the investment itself still has to make sense. And that's where, you know, I, I love businesses because businesses make a lot more sense to me than I think the real estate play does in this. Um, but the real estate play is where most people have gone. 
Yeah, the real estate play is what started it. That was kind of the igniter, just simply because of the fact that you put, you know, grid line, you put lines down on a map and say you're in, you're out. And then you get, you know, a three and a half page IRS initial legislation on this, the IRC 1400Z2. You know, it's like three and a half, four pages. And it was basically whitewashed. We didn't get a Rembrandt. I mean, we've had two separate tranche guidelines. We've got 23 different legislation bills up right now. We've got a big one in the House, a big one in the Senate. We've got a, a legislation that's up at the White House right now for review. So, you know, we're kind of seeing still continuing guidance and, and updates that are continuing to come out. Um, but, uh, you know, early on, it was real estate that ran to this. And yeah, and, and I know that there are a lot of people who wanted to go and build low income housing. And I think that that's a laudable goal. But if part of the goal of the legislation was to create jobs, low income housing has a blip when during the construction phase, but then there's not a whole lot of jobs around that. And frankly, low income housing oftentimes turns into a very difficult state several years later. It does. It does. And the thing is, is that, and then that's what, like, when we look at the real estate piece, that's what's driving, especially like right now, the big thing in the news at the moment is, is that, you know, all these reporting guideline updates. Wow. And a lot of that is, is because what they're trying to determine is what type of gentrification is going to get caused as a result of the short-term real estate coming in. You've got short-term jobs. And then typically when you come in and you're rehabbing an area, what you're doing is you're driving up the values, you're driving up prices. And then that drives up and in fact, it impacts everything locally within a, you typically within a three to five mile radius, it begins to change the demographics of, as a different elevation of people begin to move into that, that can afford it. And the people that can't are could then pushed out and move to a different area. And that's the concern with gentrification that we see or, or what, the, what the government is worried about the gentrification where businesses though are significantly different is, is that when you look at what opportunity zones are designed to do from a job creation standpoint, and then you look at the amount of businesses that are in these opportunity zones that up until this point have had a hard time getting growth capital as needed. Um, and then the businesses that can move into these opportunity zones that can really help step up jobs. I mean, when you start looking at, you know, from an opportunity fund standpoint and saying, okay, well, these are designed to be impact investing vehicles and they're designed to create jobs, businesses create the win-win scenario. And then when you add the cherry on top that from an investment standpoint, every real estate deal is capped, period. If I've got a 300 unit multifamily, you know, asset, I'm not going to get a 301 rent out of that. So mm -hmm. as an investor, that means that my growth, my earning potential, my step up in basis at the 10 year mark is actually stifled. It's the end on top of that. I have to worry about then either the, the, the renting, leasing, the selling. So I'm looking at some, some degree of an occupancy aspect to that. Right. And then my ability to increase my, my rental prices or my lease prices and or my sales prices is going to be relative to localized inflation in that area. Yeah. You take that. And, and USWTE that we're going to talk about here in a few minutes, um, it is geared towards an operating business in the waste energy space that I think, uh, creates I think it's a superstar in the creates very stable jobs. Um, now, uh, I described you as the expert on, on this, and clearly you're already showing that you're an expert on it by just the conversation. But tell us about Easy Do It. Sure. So uh, Easy Do It is an opportunity fund development company. We offer OZ fund development and OZ fund consulting services. Um, we primarily work with businesses. We do do real estate developments as well, but we set up an opportunity fund, whether it's a corporation or whether it's a partnership. But we set up the entity that is the front door, which is an opportunity fund itself. And we offer a turnkey solution to be able to do that, which is kind of taking basically everything that is related to what an opportunity fund is from a legal to an entity, to a financial, to a brand market distribution standpoint. And we do it in a rapid time frame by basically assembly lining everything and kind of going through a process like that. And we've been really blessed to be in this space since basically day one, a little bit about our background. We set up the second opportunity funds in the country to open. We did the first business-based opportunity funds in the country to open. We probably at this point, I would say have done about 90% of the business-based OZ funds. We've done uh, just over 16 billion now worth of fund development, more than any other entity in the country. 
um, and now are recognized as a top 10 expert. Two of our funds are top 25 funds, uh, recognized member of Forbes Finance Council, Forbes Real Estate Council, um, member of the top program, which is a, a, the top opportunity program, which is a joint government program between the U.S. Department of Economic Advisors to the president and the U.S. Census Bureau on what it looks like to, you know, kind of roll this program out from a technology standpoint, i.e., you know, like mapping and data analytic, that kind of stuff. Um, regularly consult with uh, one of the Trump appointed advisors to the SBA on the subject matter and just have been a passionate voice for businesses from day one in this space. And, you know, one of the best things about it from my standpoint is that the legislation was bipartisan. So, you know, we, we all know that there's uh, partisan bickering that is going on, uh, but not about this so much. Uh, no, the, 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 you know, because this is something that it, what really makes this unique is how it really kind of puts it into the hands of the individual versus Kind of the trickle down economics when the money comes into the government and by the time it makes its way down into these distressed communities it's through grant money and things like that and then even then it becomes difficult to get what this is doing is, is this is allowing the private uh investor to connect with potential investment opportunities that they might not otherwise have an opportunity to connect with take advantage of tax benefits for doing so in big big ways and have impact at the same time and so this really is something that it, I believe and am so passionate about, especially from the business side. When you look at the the, the, the verticals, the horizontal and, and vertical reaches where business impacts everything from, from medical to technology to waste to energy to uh, carbon footprinting to going green to eco to contracting. I mean, in A to Z, this is going to have a benefit in opportunity zones. And this has an opportunity to... And it's such a pun now at this point, opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. But it really is an opportunity for this country, I believe, to be able to change the landscape of what America looks like. I think we're already beginning to see, you know, the Dow's up 10,000 points in the last, since since Trump's election. And I'm not going to get political. But when we look at the landscape on this, and the, the origin of this wasn't even Trump. That's the crazy thing about it. The origin of this was actually technically under Obama is when the foundation of it got started with the people that helped mm -hmm. bring it to the table. Trump was just the one that worked with and was able to help kind of get it pushed through and then took additional executive order actions, bringing in you know 18 different federal agencies to get involved in the program. But at the end of the day, this was a job creation you know, aspect. That's what this was looked at was from that lens. And when you look at the job creation from what the tentacles and the reach of business can do across America, I think it's going to be revolutionary. I, I really, I, I, I see this completely changing the landscape of, of the prosperity of America going forward. And I wanted to invite any, uh, for those who are watching, and if you have any questions, use your chat function and send us a question and we'll be sure to do our best to get it answered. Uh, also, if you have more questions for David or the Easy Do It team, the website is up on the screen. Uh, be sure and connect with them uh, as well, uh, early and often. Uh, and I got to just tell you, from on the behalf of USWTE, we use Easy Do It. Uh, they do what they say, uh, and that's kind of uh, not what you see all the time in business. Uh, lots of times, uh, people who you're dealing with today, they just don't follow through. Easy Do It does, and so we've been very, very pleased. Um, David, going back to the difference between the focus on job creation. Right. Uh, how important is that in an opportunity zone? Well, we're getting, we know that we've got updated reporting requirements that are realistically could hit sometime as early as like right now could drop while we're on this to, you know, sometime I figure probably no later than middle to end of January. And in that is going to be a lot of the recording, the reporting requirements that the fund is going to be having to do and i believe that a lot of that is also going to be looking at what impact because the, at the end of the day if you measure the measurement of success is not going to be based off the amount of money invested into opportunity funds it's not going to be based off the amount of opportunity fund money invested into projects it's going to be the success of those projects and the metrics of jobs short term and long term that are created as a result and so, and that's a really difficult metric to gauge. These are impact, 
you know, investment vehicles at, at their core. Um, what we're seeing is definitely them being classified as that. And, and we're seeing impact investors, um, you know, that are looking at these things for just that. There still is education that you know is is being learned on them. This is still a very new program, really in a, in its infancy year. Yeah. Um, job, I, I want to talk job creation piece is going to be important. And I want to talk a little bit about USWT if I could. Um, it is a uh, an opportunity zone fund that we have uh, developed through Easy Do It. Uh, it is focused primarily on. Uh, there's the website by the way, USWT-fund.com. Uh, please be sure to go to that for questions and reach out to us as well. Um, and I'm, I, I got to go back to easy do it though, because I've already got this set up and I want to, you talk about a proven record in opportunity zone investment funds. And this is a real key. This is such new legislation from 2017, even though it did uh, start back in the previous administration. Um, what's its runway? is you know what's its runway to success for the uh, the legislation itself and for businesses tied up in it well 2020 is going to be the breakout year for businesses the reality is is that you know 120 days ago we had less than one percent saturation rate of oz fund real estate to oz fund business focused ratio fast forward 120 days since the April set of tranche guidelines came out kind of took the handcuffs off for businesses to really take this and begin to run with it you know you've got an education and an adoption period of time where the information is being absorbed and kind of digested and how do we make this applicable to us as a business but now we're starting to see that application be understood and we've seen a, a less than 1% to 7% growth in the last 120 days in business focused opportunity zone funds 2020 is going to be the breakout year where this will be absolutely business based 2020. So, but, but those investors who wait until 2020, they're missing out though on, on 5% uh, step up in their basis, right? They are, they are. And, and just a real simple example, like I said, you know, earlier in, the, in that $2 million capital gain example, I mean, that 60 seconds is a $90,000 cost that difference between 10 to 15%. And, and, you know, $90,000 for some people might not seem like a lot, but for, for others, that's a significant sum of money. Sure. Missing sure. a year's worth of wages for one minute of a prolonged decision. And the real catch 22 is, is for the, the newer investors that have realized gains, you know, August, September, October, November timeframe, and they technically have a lot longer period on their time clock to, to be able to take advantage of the program period. But they're they're up against this this wall of saying, look, is you know, is is a sixty seconds worth ninety thousand dollars to me potentially? For sure, David. I'm going to give your voice just a little bit of a break, and I'm going to talk about about uh, US uh, WTE, but also the lead technology in US WTE is is GEF. It's Green Envirotech Holdings Corporation. It's a patent pending paralysis gasification. The bottom line on what it does, it extracts oil from tires and plastics. It forever gets rid of the tires and plastics. They are gone. It also creates electricity that can be used uh, to sold to the grid or to power back the um, uh, to power back the plant itself. There's also a little bit of scrap metal, but the significance is the oil and the uh, carbon black that comes out of it. Global commodities, stable jobs, um, strong performance uh, for for the investors as well. This is not incineration, though. This is it is a different. It is a proven technology, and it's proven um, not just by what we say. It is proven because there are two third party global engineering firms that are behind it as well. And uh, one of them is a is a performance guarantee. The other one is a performance verification, and they are there. Plus. There is a, uh, a global oil company that has agreed to, to an outtake agreement to buy every drop of oil we can produce. So the product is pre-sold. And there is an even more significant globally owned refinery in the United States that has now uh, agreed to a take or pay contract where they will buy 10,000 uh, 10, barrels a day of oil. Now, does this oil, uh, some people, David, are going to say, well, you're just contributing to uh, the, uh, you know, the, the decimation of the ozone layer with your fossil fuels. No, that's not what it is. If you wear shoes, if you have a belt on, so a lot of polyester clothing, 
Oil is in so many of our products. I drive an electric car myself, uh, and uh, it's it, and it's great to be able to do that, and it's great to be able to not contribute to the decimation of the ozone layer. But just because it's oil doesn't mean that it's bad because we use it in so many of our products today. Uh, it's also environmentally friendly, does not pollute one bit, uh, and there has been a significant amount of money invested already to date for the purposes of R&D. And, you know, give us a, contact, a shout out at uswte-fund.com and we'll be able to talk more about that. Um, so, David, I wanted to bring you back in from an opportunity zone fund standpoint. I know that you're very familiar with USWTE. Is this something that um, fits within the intention of the legislation? Absolutely. I think this is, you know, a round peg and a round hole type of fit with, with the opportunity zone legislation. Here's why. Because what you've got, number one, is you, you, you've got an opportunity zone business. You've got a QOZB. You've got the ability to create localized long-term jobs in that QOZB. You are not a startup, which is, you know, even though this program is definitely definitely applicable to startups, you guys aren't in that startup phase where you're trying to alpha beta test something. You're already in that phase now where this is now full-fledged production facilities expansion. Um, you know, the, 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 the impact which, you know, again, going back to these being impact investment vehicles, I look at and saying, okay, what is the impact? It's, well, for example, you know, you put one facility up, but how many facilities could you guys realistically see over the next decade across the country? 150. 150 facilities. How many jobs would that create, you know, per facility? 100? And, uh, well, per facility, per facility is going to be at least 150 direct jobs. And then there's, there's, you know, uh, tangential development that takes place too. So there's more jobs than that. Okay. So you've got a business that has a viable product, a viable, uh, an exceptional brand. You're contracted. You're, you've got your, you're already pre-sold the product before it's even out of the ground. You've got a patented technology with a, with a ultra strong third party uh, oil uh, entity. And I don't, I'll let you go in the names if you want, but you've. Sure, I'll just tell you, it's ConocoPhillips. So you got Conoco Phillips that's connected to this that you guys have worked with to be able to get to this point of the paralysis gasification. You've got you know patent technology, patent uh, some and patent pending on others. Mm -hmm. you, you're all the right makings for what a investor would normally not have access to unless you guys went public. Would now have access to as a capital gain investor. And, you know, as an investor looking at it, it check marks the boxes of your, your third party fund administrator, you know, you, so you've got transparency oversight built in, you've got strong operating history already, you've got skin in the game to the, you know, in this, you, they're not the only investor in, you know, coming to the table and what GEF USWTE is. Right. You've, so you've got all the makings of what would be an, a, a, a viable, a very, not just a viable, but, but really one of those type of investments that when I think about it, especially at like my age, I'm, I don't mind, I'm 40 years old. I, I look at 10 years down the line for me, I'm 50. I'm rounding that, that curve to retirement. I'm, I'm looking at something that, you know, I want good growth, good returns, good yield. I, I don't want my eggs in a basket where it's going to fail. Yeah. And you know, these plants have a, a 25 year life uh, but I have to tell you, the the mantra around the company is that we want to succeed ourselves out of business. Uh, we want to clean up all the tires and the plastics around the planet. Um, but at the same point in time, we're also realistic. There's so much waste and there's so much new waste that is being created. That is, it's going to outlast us, I think. And, well, and, and we've got to get to it. Generational impact that, you know, we talk, we can talk job creation impact. But when you talk about planetary impact, generational, I mean, it's it's now known, and if you don't know, then just Google it. But I mean, there's plastic particles all the way down at the deepest depths of our oceans. Yeah. yeah. And and now this is this is impacting, you know, from a microscopic level. If it's impacting at a microscopic level, what's it impacting in the foods that we eat, the mm -hmm. air that we breathe, the 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 liquids that we put into our body. You know, and, and this is something that if, if we as a, at least I'm an advocate of this, 
as a planet, if we don't take the, the necessary steps all, and the, and the thing is, is it's not just one, because you guys can't do it alone. And I think you no. recognize that. But this is part of a greater, greener solution of saying, we've got to be able to have a planet left over for our kids and grandkids. That's true. And, and normally, uh, you know, environmental investments don't do too well. It just it just hasn't been that. We've turned that around with this. So the the graphic that's up on the screen, the Alaskan North Slope crude oil. Uh, normally in, in the past, pyrolysis based oil was almost like a sludge. Um, we've been able to fix the process, and that's why we have a very high grade of oil that is it's even higher than Brent crude. So if you know anything at all about oil prices, just or if you want to go to oilpricestoday.com and what you're going to do is you're going to see that Brent crude is at the top and Alaska North Slope crude oil is even better than that. And that's what we make. What that means then is that the refineries have less expenses uh, in terms of being able to make it uh, as a marketable product. So it doesn't necessarily go into your car. Instead, it may very well go into the making of, of our uh, of products in our everyday lives. Tires and plastics are what, you know, or basically oil is the primary component of tires and plastics. We can also get carbon black out of it. And carbon black is something that is used in paint, in roads, in making tires. Also the highest refined carbon black goes into your cartridge toner for uh, printing. Um, so it's, it's a business whose time has come. And David, you talked about the oceans, and this fact just scares the heck out of me. By the year 2050, by the year 2050, the weight of plastics in the oceans is supposed to outweigh the fish. And when we get to that, then we have a real problem on our hands, and we can stop that. Um, I'm going to go past that. I'm going to go past that as well. I want to get back to, to you, David, with regard to the Opportunity Zone funds themselves and there has been some discussion in Congress about uh, more stringent reporting requirements than what was originally crafted in the legislation. Why is that and, and what's the status of it? Well, the status is that we're getting ready to have basically a blending of the first two tranches that we had that came out and then also this new update. I think this one's like 560 pages or something like that that we're supposed to 560, 590, something along those different lines. We should be seeing that here pretty soon. At, at the end of the day, this is... The concern is, is that when you look at what this is as a tax tax initiative, this is really going to kind of fall into one of two categories, either the biggest tax giveaway in the U.S. history or the biggest tax incentive in the U.S. history, one of the two. And I think that when we look at the reporting requirements, we need to have, you know, tighter reporting requirements to some degree. And, I, and I'm good with that. I really am. I, I, but I also think that with, with that also needs to come more flexibility in what our zone reporting and that, hey, you know, if a zone is, you know, like we th there's top five, top 10 markets where there's going to be a lot of money that saturates those markets. The reality of it is, is the amount of money that's going to saturate those markets and the amount of time that's going to take to turn those markets around relative to other markets then needing capital you have to also give the flexibility for the states and the localities to readjust the opportunity zones themselves to create new areas, to shift areas without penalty to existing fund investments that have been made in what were previously designated opportunity zones. Yeah, yeah. So we've got to be able to re record that. The, 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 the difficult one, and I don't really know that legislation is, is the right answer for it, but it's going to be what impact looks like because impact right now is subjective is it jobs created is it you know houses established you know is it a certain benchmark for housing is is it a certain benchmark for business growth uh you know is it a certain benchmark for for movement in or out of uh, a particular area so th that's still a little bit i think unknown and truly in my in my opinion relatively difficult to try to measure um especially yeah, in what they're that, trying to that's do that's for sure yeah, and from our standpoint, um, because what we are are doing is that each plant is organized in a in a separate entity. Uh, we find the reporting requirements are, are just about anything that they ask us. We're it's going to be very easy for us uh, because the product is created inside the opportunity zone. Uh, the employees are inside the opportunity zone. The products are sold out of the opportunity zone. It's all right there in the opportunity zone itself. So 
the reporting is really pretty simple. In your guys' case, and, and truly for most for most of these, especially businesses, you should be able to report, you know, what you started out in January with as far as employees and then what you ended up in December with as far as employees. And, I want to, and, I, I want to, and gauge growth that way. Um, but it, this should be relatively easy for most businesses to adhere to what the guidance is. I'm not overly concerned about the updated guideline reporting requirements. Yeah. Good. Good. I, I also wanted to touch base about credit risk because every investor needs to be concerned about credit risk because this, you know, risk management is what you do. Well, and think about opportunity zone funds. If I could just for a second before sure. we, I'm looking at the the credit risk scenario on my screen, but I I think it's important to definitely recognize with opportunity zone funds that that every opportunity zone fund has no prior performance history. There is nothing for an investor to be able to gauge what, okay, over the last five years, we've had a stabilized, annualized, you know, 7% return consistently. Right. And I can assume that going forward for the next five years, I'm looking at a 7% return. Everything that you're seeing in opportunity funds is forecasted. And the only thing that is there is a sponsor history, a manager history of maybe saying, yeah, I've managed money before and I've been pretty successful. Um, I hope that maybe that might segue a little bit better into what you're getting ready to go into on credit risk. I think it does um, because in in creating the fund and then also in working with GET, uh, the Green Environmental Holdings Corporation, uh, we as business people know that credit risk and just downside risk, operational risk, is something that everybody's concerned about. Um, in, in, in an actuality, we have worked, worked really hard to eliminate the risk as much as possible because of the performance guarantees that I mentioned before. These performance guarantees are not just from us. These performance guarantees are from third party global uh, engineering firms. And that's very, very significant. And so because of that, um, we're gonna, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work uh, from an operational standpoint. I, in my honest opinion, Stan, and I don't say this lightly, and I, you know, represent or have helped develop a lot of funds, and there are a lot of great opportunity zone business-based funds out there. Reality is, I haven't seen one yet that actually can offer an investor a, what 10 years worth of protection would look like on my investment into an opportunity zone fund. And, and I think that what's commendable and i think that that's really what is the one of the biggest separating factors from this fund versus both real estate and all the other business funds out there is is that the elimination of risk to me as an investor because of you know you guys have been what at this for eight plus years now you know you're, this, you're not a, this isn't fresh around the block for no, you our r d was eight years worth and eight years worth of r d and so i look at this as an investor and say i Downside protection, operational risk eliminated, guaranteed credit risk, plant fully developed. We know guaranteed third parties are in place. We know, you know, the, the product is already sold before you've ever even got it refined. It's, if I'm an investor looking at wanting to know, can I get something stable that I can guarantee for the most part? And, and that's where this, I think, is, is significantly different. And, and not that any investment is ever an absolute guarantee, but when you look at what a risk you know, ratio standpoint is, uh, this, in my mind, definitely, you know, if it were my own money for me investing, this definitely is on that very, very low risk threshold. Um, the, you wrote a, a column, uh, and it's, gosh, it's a, a year old now, but it's, uh, what investors investors need to know about a, quali a qualified opportunity fund. You've talked about a, just about everything so far, but I just wanted to make sure again: is there any unusual risk, uh, anything outside the norm for an investor in an opportunity zone? Well, there is actually there, there is, and you know, we're, I'm gonna we'll probably get a little deep on this. Okay, so. The, first of all, there's to me, even with having a hundred percent occupancy rate or something to that nature on real estate, um, there are significant changes that's coming down the real estate market where I see a lot of potential risk in the future. Um, most real estate deals, especially in the commercial side, the way that these things are played out, 
they're based off of interest rates that are tied to a LIBOR index, mm -hmm. the London Interbank Offering Rate, right? Well, come 2021, the, the LIBOR rate is, will be no longer is what commercial will be based off on. It will be based off of what's called the SOFA rate, the SOFA over and offering rate. Well, the indexes on the way that those two rates track are significantly different. The LIBOR has a tendency to track more along the lines of the movement of the 10-year treasury, whereas the SOFA rate follows the Fed funds rate. Uh, and I mean, it, over the last year, if you were to lay an overlay map over the SOFA and the Fed funds, it is a virtual mirror. So what I see is, is that when you look at the real estate deals and why I say that there's risk, you know, midterm, long term is because a lot of the real estate is contingent upon a leverage strategy where they're looking at refinance scenarios, which is going to be contingent upon, you know, a valuation model on the on the entity and the ability to borrow. I think that when we're bottomed out at virtually bottomed out at a Fed funds rate, there's not much room to go over a 10-year period other than up, number one. Number two, when we look at the amount of supply versus demand that's going to hit the market around the same time, we're going to have an oversaturation of supply, which usually if we have an oversaturation of supply and we've got rising interest rates, the cost to borrow, what you've got now is lower valuations and less people wanting to borrow money typically. And what concerns me about the risk in the way of real estate based opportunity zone funds is that for me as an investor, and this is true for all opportunity zone funds, whether it's real estate or business, for me as an investor, it really isn't about me rolling my money into it. It's not even about me holding my money for a 10 year period of time. It's somewhat about you as an as a fund being able to reinvest the money and, and generate a capital at the end of the day. The real question is, is how do I take my monopoly paper money and turn it into liquid cash in my bank account when the 10 year comes? How do I get that effect of realize that full step up in growth? How do I get liquid with my investment? And the concern is, is that with the real estate model, especially with it, with it not being talked about the changes coming down the line that will impact supply, demand, values and rates in the future. There's there's definitely an upside risk to the real estate side of opportunity zone funds. I think that a lot of that can be mitigated with the business based funds because mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no ceiling on earnings potential. Uh, right. So I do like that when you talk about risk and business based funds. Now you're talking about do you are you investing in something that is established and growing or are you investing in something that is trying to get established to grow? You know, a startup versus mm -hmm. something eight years old that's backed all this other stuff that's gone through the trials and tribulations, climbed the mountain a couple times. So when I look at a risk profile on business-based funds, the funds that have gone through and, and the way that USWTE is makes more sense. It's a much, much, much lower risk threshold, risk profile. And I, I think it's ultimately something that for a good lot of these investors, you know, if I'm an investor, if I'm 50, I'm, I'm talking about my own personal retirement, looking at saying I'm going to be 60. And if I'm putting money and I'm holding the 10 year gain, what does it look like if I'm 50, 55? Yeah. I'm, I'm counting on this for retirement. Do I want a, a higher risk reward or do I want something that could potentially give a high reward, but also is mitigating a lot of my potential risk? You know, it's interesting that you would talk about that. I just had lunch with someone yesterday and that's the entire thing he talked about was his retirement. He says, I'm wanting something uh, that is safe in my re in, in retirement. So that's what he's looking at. He's he is looking at opportunity zones, but he is not enamored with the real estate base anymore. Uh, instead, he wants operational income. And, you know, that's where you got to look at your risk management. And from a USWTE standpoint, we invite you to look at our risk management and to see how that would work for you. Um, I did want to go back just a tiny bit to social impact. And I know impact investing is something that's really talked an awful lot about today. Um, I think it's a bit of an oxymoron because every investment that you make has an impact. It's what impact do you want it to make? Um, and when I was talking before about how long a period of time these last, these plants are built for 25 years, although they will last longer than that if you keep them up. Uh, instead, it's we know we're going to continue to make more plastic waste. We know we're going to uh, continue to make more tire waste. What do we do with it? We can't pile it up. We've got to do something with it. And that's where the technology of Green Envirotech Holdings, which is part of w, uh, USWTE, can come into play. 
You've um, got a Mount Trashmore here in Virginia. <laughs> that literally is just that. I mean, and, and and we joke about it. I mean, it's a nice area now, but I mean, underneath these two mounds, three mounds are, it's it's a landfill that's been covered over, and it's Mount Trashmore. Um, oh, is that really what you call it? That's the legitimate name is Mount Trashmore. <laughs> as crazy as it sounds, but the reality is, you look at the country and say, okay, you know, you, you Virginia Beach is relatively flat, and then all of a sudden you see these two big giant you know, mounds that, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a hike up there. We can't have a bunch of Mount Trashmores littering across our country. Right. And I live out in the Seattle area. Get get the stuff off the planet. And and I'm in the Seattle area and we, we uh, care deeply for our environment here, but we can't stop the the trash either. And, you know, the cities in our area are, are, uh, we're talking with cities all over the country, but particularly out here. And they're saying, you know, can you help us get rid of this trash? We can't send it to China anymore. Um, we only we have less than five minutes left. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that we we wrap this up in a way so that a potential investor or or anyone out there uh, can know where to go if there's questions about opportunity zones. Uh, let's say that I'm an investor and I'm really interested and I want to do something before the end of the year and I call Easy Do It. What am I going to get in return? Uh, well, you're going to get us talking about uh, really kind of pointing you to our our OZ fund list. Um, we're not broker dealers, so we don't ever get into interest rate. We don't ever talk about details. We don't try to, you know, particularly sway an investor into or out of. We'll answer questions uh, about the about the program. Uh, if they if they're interested in a particular fund, what we want to do is immediately just get them connected with the fund manager, and so that way they're getting the questions answered firsthand. And um, you know, the nice thing is is that at the end of the day. For the investors that are listening to this, that catch this, that are trying to stop a clock between now and December 31st, it takes all of 10, 15 minutes max, maximum. Okay. And you can stop your clock. You can make an investment pretty quick. It's a subscription agreement, a wire transfer. You're done. I mean, it's it's not a complex thing to invest into these things. Not, they weren't designed to be that way. And then uh, here is the USWTE fund. And I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to uh, go to the web because what I want to do is show you the green Envirotech channel, which is like a video FAQ. And I hope that you can see this link right there that I've highlighted. Um, and this is our, our, our president of our company, Mark Gantar, has gone through a bunch of different questions. And if you didn't get your questions answered today, I almost guarantee you, you can get your questions answered on the, the video FAQ channel on YouTube. I uh, strongly encourage you to do that. Um, David, last words. Uh, just encouraging all investors with capital gains. Um, this is a use it or lose it program. I encourage you to get your capital gains rolled into an opportunity fund, get the impact investing going. Um, if you're looking for a business-based opportunity fund that you know is going to be there, that's going to be secure for the next 10 years, I don't know that you're going to find better than, than USWTE. And um, uh, it just, it's been an honor. Thank you. If you've got questions about opportunity funds, you can check us out at easydoit.com. Uh, we've got podcasts. The, we run the, it's called the OZ podcast. We do videos. We've got eBooks. If you're new to opportunity funds, we've got a lot of content. Um, we're just trying to be out there, you know, giving you the best information that we possibly can. And so visit us online at easydoit.com. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, David. Take care. Thanks, Stan. Thanks, everyone.